So hi and welcome to another edition of We Are Mission, a podcast by Miss You Scotland. I'm Gerard Goff, the Communications Officer, and I'm delighted to be joined by my former football coach and current parish priest in Kilmarnock, Father Martin Chambers. Hi Father, thank you. Hello Gerard, thanks for inviting me to be part of this Miss You chat. Not a problem, Father. So, could you tell us a wee bit about your background for people who maybe maybe don't know? Okay, so... Um, my family uh, have been, well, I've been brought up in Irvine. Um, I was born in Glasgow uh, in Duke Street, uh, Duke Street Maternity Hospital, but then at the age of two moved down to Irvine and was raised up in, in Irvine. Uh, my family, uh, I have two elder brothers and an elder sister and mum and dad. Um, we, were, we lived in Irvine for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, dad passed away about seven years ago, and Mum's eighty nine, still to the fore. Mm-hmm. So, what did Mum and Dad do? Uh, so, Mum was a radiographer um, <clears throat> until she contracted MS at the age of forty two. So that was nineteen seventy five. So she's had MS for all those years, um, and but even today, I I saw her uh, for a for a brief period of time, and uh, she still. Um, you know, full of chat. She wants to know all about politics. Hmm. Uh, she's telling me about some of the political shenanigans that are going on uh, at this time. <coughs> that uh, she wants to tell you all about the football, <laughs> um, and she picks up in everything that's that's happening. We're getting new shutters uh, in St Matthew's Church, and she was asking, "Have you had a?" Have you had an appointment with the shutters people? So, so um, mum's uh, still to four. She was a radiographer. Dad uh, worked at ICI for um, many years, and that's why we ended up being in in Ayrshire because obviously the the main factory was at our dear at Stevenson, um, and he worked until he was fifty. Worked at ICI until he was fifty four. He was given retirement. I think as as many people. Um, he was a, a a manager, one of the managers at the factory, um, and he was given retirement at 54, which allowed him uh, to spend many, many fruitful and great years uh, looking after mum um, until he himself became ill and passed away about seven years ago. So, um, so. Uh, what was um, what was family life like? I um, so well. I'm the youngest, so. Um, I it was the usual carry on when you're growing up. Um, make it uh, taking the Mickey out of one another, and um, you know playing, also fighting. No, it was great. It was it was great fun, and we had great family holidays. Uh, we went to uh, Borough Head down in in Galloway uh, for a caravan holiday. I remember we went to Rothsey once. Um, we also for two years between I was the age of seven to ten that's more than two and a, two and a half years um, <clears throat> uh, we lived down in Manchester because dad got a job at the uh, factory at Blakely in Manchester so we had to we had to go down there mm-hmm. so uh, uh, in terms of yourself at uh, school what sort of things did you enjoy I was just involved um, just uh, uh, just the usual primary school games um, I wasn't I don't think I was particularly um, sporty um, but I, I just I like to get involved in anything that was going on um, I think that's been the kind of uh, that's been a theme throughout <laughs> throughout my life I wasn't particularly good at anything but I like to get involved um, <clears throat> interestingly enough uh, yesterday I was just at the the golden wedding of George and Anne McGrattan, Father Stephen McGrattan's uh, mum and dad, um, and I was mentioned in the in the uh, summary of their married life because uh, they were able to say that uh, in 1974, the year we come back from Manchester, uh, Anne McGrattan was my primary primary six teacher at St Mary's in Irvine, and um, she had to leave halfway through the year to go and have her first child, who became. Stephen McGrattan, so there we are. So it's it's, it's amazing. Um, but I think particularly in Ayrshire, you know, things always seem to come round in circles. You know, there's always 
there's always people that you knew from, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago, you know, seem to come in and out of your life, you know. So, no, our, our family um, growing up was, um, it was, it was typical. You know, we were um, involved in all sorts of clubs, cubs, scouts. Claire was involved in the, the brownies and the guides. And we went to church, obviously, on a regular basis, so. So quite a kind of traditional Catholic family. Mm -hmm. You would say so. I, I mean, in St Mary's and Irvine, uh, during during my, you know, growing up years, uh, Tom Murphy was the parish priest at St Mary's and Irvine. We had a kind of whole host of um, uh, assistant priests because Irvine uh, was it had been designated in the mid sixties as a kind of new town, so. It was a kind of bustling place to be. There was lots of people had come down, like ourselves, had come down from, from Glasgow um, and the parishes of um, St Margaret's in Castle Park and St John Ogilvy's in Burdriel hadn't yet been erected as parishes, you know, so everything was focused in St Mary's where uh, mum and dad were involved in the pastoral council and readings and I was involved as a as an altar server. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, obviously, you know, faith did play a big part in your life from, from quite an early age. Mm -hmm. Did you consider being anything else other than a priest when you were younger? Or was there something else you wanted to be? Or did you always have your kind of heart set on becoming a priest? It's, it's, it's kind of peculiar. I, th I think probably the answer, <laughs> the answer to that is no. Yeah. Uh, but that's principally because uh, that I was asked, did I want to become a priest at the age of 12? Which seems a bit kind of unusual for... Um, and certainly unique for for the modern day, um, the modern day uh, student for the priesthood. Um, in the seventies, we had we still had junior seminaries. So uh, the junior seminary at Langbank, St Vincent's and Langbank, and St Mary's and Blairs was um, a secondary school, basically a boarding secondary school for anyone that thought they wanted to be uh, one day be a priest. Um, Obviously, it wasn't formal training for the priesthood, um, but the staff in both those places was mainly priests. Were mainly priests, um, and obviously they talked a lot about vocations to the priesthood. But basically, it was a secondary school, so we did all our um, subjects, we did all our sports, we did our O grades and our hires uh, at Blairs. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of usual. Um, it was a usual secondary school. It was only towards the end of, you know, Blair's when you got to, I suppose, fifth and sixth year that you started to see that the guys above you and the years above you had gone on to senior seminary and they were going, uh, they were going to, you know, they, they were making a, a further serious commitment to the priesthood. Also, you got lots of uh, former uh, students coming back and, you know, celebrate mass or giving a talk or whatever, you know. So um, it it was, uh, I think my path to the priesthood, at least through secondary school years, was, in modern terms anyway, it was uh, different, if not unique. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was, it was, I think you'd mentioned before that your mum and dad were a kind of really big influence. Would you say that they were the kind of catalyst for you deciding to take up a vocation or anything else? Um, I I think I think you're right. Um, I think mum and dad have been the biggest influences in my life, regardless of what I've been, regardless of what I've done uh, in subsequent years and what parishes I've been in, what I've done with my life. Um, the constant, um, the, the constant presence um, of mum and dad, and even although dad's passed away, you know that that sense that. Uh, he's still guiding. He's still influencing. Um, I, I I would say that they've been the biggest influence, and, and I think it's in spite of I don't know how properly to explain this, but I think it's in spite of Mum's MS. Mm -hmm. You know, it's constant. It's been you know it's you know forty seven years since he was uh, properly diagnosed, um, so it's been a constant presence. But the way I would describe it is it's not the thing that's marked her life. Um, you know, 
she's got on, as I, as I was saying today, you know, she's just asking about all the regular things. When's that TV debate about the the political debate, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the who's going to be the new uh, prime minister, new Tory leader? Um, when's that on? She wants to know about anything that's going on in the parish. She wants to know um, about uh, the football, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So... She has taught me, and Dad also, who cared for her for all those years, both of them have taught me that life is for living and life is for enjoying. And there might be illnesses, there might be um, setbacks, there might be um, uh, even traumas. But, you know, we're still invited to the purpose of life is to still to find meaning and purpose and dynamism, in spite of in spite of what we might uh, um, call our crosses in life, and of course, that uh, is the message uh, of the Christian uh, the Christian faith. That for every Good Friday we may experience, there is an Easter Sunday. For every moment of despair, there is a moment of hope. Absolutely. In terms of uh, the, the term vocation, what does it mean to you in its broadest sense? I think that vocation, th as far as I understand it, vocation is that calling from God, but not not just a calling from God to be married, to be a person of service, to be a priest, to be a religious, but b long before that... Um, in as a child when we were born, called to be a child of God, uh, and indeed you know further back than that. Mm -hmm. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you through and through. So, um, I think I think I am called uh, to be the best version of Martin Chambers that I could possibly be. Um, you know, within that, obviously, um, I've responded to the to the calling of of priesthood. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in terms of, you know, discerning your vocation, what was the, the journey like and was there any surprises along the way? I was, I mean, I look back now, as I say, when I got to the end of sixth year or probably in um, the spring, the Easter time of uh, sixth year, uh, bishop Taylor, who was our bishop at the time, came up to Blair's and told me and another student uh, that were for Galloway Diocese that were thinking of going on to senior seminary that he was going to send us to Drygrange in the borders, to the seminary in the borders. And um, I was happy with that. I, I didn't really know much about any of the four seminaries that were available at the time other than what I'd heard. And I'd heard favourable stories from all the priests that I'd known that had got, some had gone to Rome, some had gone to Drygrange, some had gone to the seminary in Glasgow and some had gone to Spain and they were all favourable. So it didn't really, it didn't really um, um, sway me one way or the other. But then it come, you know, spring forward to two or three months later when uh, Bishop Taylor asked me and mum and dad to go down to see him in air and he had changed his mind and he had decided to send me to Spain. Um, and it was only years later that I I found out that uh, Archie Brown, as the priest in Troon, had, was on the staff at the time, whom I knew, knew well through being on the staff. Uh, and he had intervened and said, I think Martin Chambers should go to Spain. Um, and I look back in my life now and I think, well, life might have been very different if I'd been sent to uh, to the borders, um, I'm sure I would have still been happy. But the fact that I went to Spain, the fact that I was um, um, thrown into learning Spanish mm -hmm. um, has obviously influenced my life for later decisions yep. about going to South America and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, I think in terms of vocation, I, I was, as I say, I... I generally throw myself into things. So I was deeply immersed in college life in, in Valladolid, where the college was at that time. 
Um, I was, oh, I was sacristan, sub-sacristan. I was MC. I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I took up the guitar. I played at mass. We got involved in all sorts of catechism. I was a uh, um, rec room man for the college, all that kind of stuff. So we got involved in all sorts of very enjoyable things. Um, I would say a key moment came when, in two years before I was ordained in 1987, when my sister um, got married. She was the first of our, my siblings to get married. In fact, I think she was the first of any of the cousins to get married. Um, and she got, uh, Claire got married to Michael in June of 1987, and I was allowed to go home from Valladolid for that. Um, but from the high of the wedding, um, I, I was, you know, that summer, um, the high of the wedding and the enjoy and the enjoyment of the wedding, that summer, my brother, um, one of my brothers, Francis, um, got engaged and as if to kind of underline the beauty of marriage and also one of the students who had um, trained with me in in the seminary uh, announced that he was leaving the priesthood. Um, So there was a kind of growing message at the back of my mind, was I actually being called to priesthood or was I being called to married life Mm -hmm. Uh, because, because of those, particularly because of those three factors. And I was, I think I had decided that um, that I was going to call it quits, actually, that summer of 1987. Um, and to make matters worse, at least in my mind, <laughs> in the mind of a 23-year-old, to make matters worse, of my five-week holiday home, I was being told to go and spend two weeks in a parish. Um, and I thought, well, I've only got five weeks. How, how come, you know, how can I possibly, you know, have only three weeks holiday. But anyway, um, so, and bizarrely, um, the parish that uh, I was sent to for for that pastoral placement was St. Matthew's in Kilmarnock, <laughs> where we are sitting right now. <laughs> um, and I remember Joe Boland, who was a parish priest at the time, uh, came over to Irvine to pick me up. And... On the journey over, Joe was kind of saying, uh, well, we've only got two weeks, so we need to get involved in the the secondary school. We need to get involved in the primary school. We need to get involved in the unemployment project. We need to get involved in the catechetical programme. There's also Renew has been starting, so we need to get invo- get you involved in all these programmes. And I remember in the car, him chatting away, chatting away, chatting away. And all the time I'm thinking, you do whatever you want. I've decided I'm leaving, you know, I've decided I'm packing it in. Um, And that's uh, what happened the first night. And I think a key thing during that pastoral placement, Joe had said, I'd like you to keep a diary of your two weeks here. Not not a diary of, you know, we did this, we did that, but, you know, really express your feelings about about that. And so I found... um, when I went into my room that night, uh, I wrote down. It was the first. I think it was the first time I'd had a chance to really put down all my thoughts. And I'm really disgruntled uh, with going forward. I'm not happy with it. I think God might be calling me to married life, etc. For all of those reasons, um, and I, I, I wish I'd kept that diary because it, it was certainly was a key moment mm-hmm. because. Within a day, and certainly within two days, of being in touch with people, uh, in meeting them in the unemployment project or in the schools uh, or in the Renew programme, I found it, it was it was like night and day. I suddenly realised I was at home in parish life. And although I'd been involved in catechetical programmes in the college, you never really got, possibly you never really got really close to people so I found that just being with people chatting to them as well as doing whatever task you had at hand whether it was arranging a class mass or or getting the renew program pastoral program up and running um, I, I found that just being with people I suddenly realized no no this is what I'm called to be this is 
God is actually calling me to the priesthood. And I suppose looking back on it as well, in a kind of spiritual way, maybe I had to go through that Good Friday of the the doubts and fears mm-hmm. uh, about whether I was actually being called to priesthood, so that I could actually come to the moment of hope um, and real blessing. Um, I I'm not saying it's all been plain sailing <laughs> since then, mm-hmm. uh, but it cert- that certainly was a was a key moment um, in in working out what actually God was calling me to. So that kind of closeness with people, that kind of connection with people. Um, something you felt early on. When you were discerning your vocation, did you ever think about being anything other than a parish priest? Like, could you consider a congregation or an order or going on missions early doors? I think the answer to that probably is no, until I had, um, until I decided that I was going to uh, work on the missions when my mum reminded me, I, I actually, I say reminded me, but I'm not sure that I knew this. Um, at the age of seven, when we were still down in, a, when we were still down in Manchester in the mm. town of Bury near Manchester, um, we had had a mission from the Columban Fathers, and apparently I wrote to the priest because the the Far East magazine was out even at that time. And, uh, you know, I wrote to the priest mentioned at the back of the Far East magazine run by the Columban Fathers that, um, that A, I wanted to be a priest and B, I wanted to be a missionary priest working on the missions. I, I, I have no recollection of writing that letter, but my mum says that um, I definitely uh, wrote it and got a reply I think she said that the priests, because I was only seven or eight at the time, the priest had said, you know, stick in at school and uh, when you're older, you can think about it. So, so no, my, my connection in the initial stages was always with um, uh, the, the diocesan priesthood because it made a big impact in my life. You know, the, the assistant priests and the parish priests that I'd met in principally in Irvine, but in other places as well. I I mean, in in terms of your vocation, is there any kind of saint you've turned to or scripture passage that kind of defines it? We were very fortunate um, amongst the many blessings uh, to have been, um, to have come my way from being in the seminary in Spain. Uh, We were blessed um, by having in close proximity to Valladolid, uh, the towns of Avila, and the towns of Segovia, so mm-hmm. they, they're uh, cities that are um, associated with St. Trees of Avila and St. John of the Cross in Segovia. Um, and they, they still have, uh, you know, the, the the two of them together transformed the, the Carmelite order and, mm-hmm. and renewed it. It's at, at, around about the time of the Reformation, uh, the Council of Trent and all that kind of stuff where things were having to be renewed in the church and, and getting, as it were, the church uh, trying to get back to basics after living through, uh, you know, the early part of the Middle Ages. And, you know, their call to, you know, simplicity of life, um, you know, you know, let's actually be people of prayer. Let's not be people of... Uh, within the convent walls of prestige and honour, let's let's be people of service. Let's be people of prayer. Was was something that that even as a kind of uh, nineteen, twenty, twenty two year old really appealed to me. Um, I think the I think the other they had they had a very big influence. I would say as well as you know Scottish saints, Saint Margaret of Scotland, mm-hmm. Saint John Olvey. Um, I knew about um, St Ignatius of Loyola um, but it was only through, it was only once I'd become a priest that that St Ignatius of Loyola um, principally through the encouragement of uh, Joe Boland, the the parish priest at St St. Matthew's at the time um, I got involved in the spiritual exercises of St Ignatius and uh, you know over the subsequent 35 years uh, since I was in a pastoral placement here, 
in St Matthew's, I have done the spiritual exercises in daily life over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done them as a as a condensed eight day retreat. I've done them as a thirty day retreat. Uh, I've done them in in the UK, but I've also um, done the spiritual exercises in Manresa, where Saint Ignatius himself had his big revelation uh, city near uh, Barcelona. Um, the basic point of the spiritual exercises is that people should be able to uh, are, are called to find God in daily life um, which seems a kind of basic thing you know but it's a challenging thing as well because you know how can we find God um, in the midst of an illness how can we find God um, in the crying uh, wanes that I've got in front of me. How can we find God? Uh, we can clearly find God in in the loving moments of a wedding ceremony, for instance, or where you're taking, uh, for instance, taking disabled children on holiday to Lourdes. But, but how can we find God in the harder moments of life? That's the challenge. Um, and Ignatius um invited those that were doing the spiritual exercises to to really e examine not just what's going on in your head that you can plan this and reason this but actually to to pay attention also to what's going on in your heart the moods of your heart so that that God can actually be there in the moments of despair as well as the moments of deep joy God can be there in the moments of pain and anguish as well as in the moments of uh, hope um it's it's a style of prayer which, um, you know, I use even till this morning, you know. So, I mean, that's obviously some something that you draw strength from. Then I take mm -hmm. it. What else do you draw strength from, um, as a priest? Um, I draw strength from. Um, I, I principally draw strength, I think, from uh, my family uh, and my close friends that that um, have been a great um, support. The reason the reason they are a great support, and I, I think I probably only realised this um, when I lived abroad, when I lived away um, on the missions, and I didn't have them on a daily or a weekly basis beside me, um, because I think the great thing that they do... Um, is they tell me the truth. Um, you know, there's no kind of buttering up of if there's a decision to be made or an opinion to be sought. Um, you know, they'll say it and they'll say it clearly. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes the temptation, certainly for me, the temptation would be in parish life uh, just to get caught up in a whirlwind of uh, projects and plans and all that kind of stuff, you know. And you need you need to be able to step back from time to time and uh, get a bit of perspective. I, I have to say, um, I've also drawn great strength from some fantastic people mm -hmm. uh, that I have met in the parishes. Um, you know, in in all of the parishes where I've served in the Galloway Diocese, there are inspirational people, um, you know, who, um, you know, in in all of the parishes, in St John's and Stevenson, St Thomas's Muir Kirk, St Bride's West Coast Bride, um, in the Kilmarnock parishes where I've served in Galston, Hurlford, Stewart, and all of these places. And quite often, um, quite often, the inspirational people are those that involved, let's say, for instance, um, in the pastoral councils or in the social committees. But quite often, um, the 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 inspirational people are people who are on the peripheries, um, and um, you know, people who are, who are, you know um, have great setbacks in life. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking of two people in per in particular, um, um, in in a former parish, where 
you know, they couldn't get involved in, the family couldn't get involved in, in the activities of the parish because they were looking after someone who was desperately ill. Mm -hmm. um, or I think of, you know, um, uh, the man who used to cut the grass in Stevenson. Um, a, a big area of grass round about the church and you'd hear, you know, the the grass cutter going for hours on end because he was cutting the grass. And then suddenly you were aware of that the, it all gone silent and I better go and speak to him, you know. And I, I went round all the church and the grass cutter, it was a grass cutter you sat on. The grass cutter was there, but he was nowhere to be seen. And I thought, where is he? Where is he? He was in the church praying. And I thought, wow, wow, here's me, the priest, you know. Um, you know, wondering where where the grass cutter was and he was in front of the Blessed Sacrament. So, uh, you know, inspirational people within the parish are, are you know, are, you know, the reason why you would get up every morning and want to continue to serve. Excellent. So, um, you know, obviously there's the parishes that you mentioned that you served in, in Gallery Diocese, but you made the decision to go on missions and you went to Ecuador. So tell us a wee bit about how that came about and tell us a wee bit about how you were received when you went there. So I think, so I went I went to Ecuador in 2004, but actually in 1994, sorry, I joined up with a, a, a it's not a congregation, uh, an association called the St. James, the Missionary Society of St. James the Apostle. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, it was set up in Boston Archdiocese um, for diocesan priests from, a, you know, from the English speaking world who wanted to give themselves to work on the mission. So um, over the years, uh, the St. James priests have served in Peru, Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, and in 1994, um, I was... Um, De Father Dermot Healy uh, had been working on the missions and he said, you know, I got in touch with him and made a kind of inquiries about, uh, about, um, about, you know, starting as a missionary. Um, and after oh, probably about six months of, you know, battling it back and forth in my, in my mind, I decided against it. And here's the reason uh, I decided against it because how could I possibly, uh, leave my family when my mum's uh, so ill um, and so I just ditched it uh, only to take it up 10 years later uh, and she was still she was still to the fore and still uh, fighting fit amidst the amidst the um, amidst the MS uh, and if I went in 2004 I went out in 2002 for a recce mm -hmm. uh, my month's holiday that year uh, I spent in Latin America. I spent um, ten days with Col Father Colin McInnes in Quito, mm -hmm. uh, Dominic Quinn in Bolivia, and Dermot Healy in Peru. And I think after that, I, I began to set in motion uh, the process. Um, it took me a couple of years to um, to you know to bring it to fruition. Um, I remember. No one in the parish, I was in St. John's and Stevenson at the time, no one in the parish was aware that I was thinking about this uh, because, I, well, I didn't want to tell people in case it didn't come to fruition. Um, but I managed to, um, uh, you know, I had a week's holiday. They knew I was just away for uh, midweek. Uh, so I managed to go out to Boston on the Monday uh, we had interviews the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and came back on the Friday, by which time I'd been accepted. Um, and I remember when uh, Bob Thomas, the the priest that ran it, came down, or he was the director at the time, came down and said, hey, Martin, you're in. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I want to be in. <laughs> but uh, I, I, knew it was the, I knew it was a thing that I'd been thinking about for a long period of time. And, you know, it, it's one of those... It's kind of influenced me uh, in the way that I encourage people now to that are wondering what they should do in life, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, 
and I did, I you battle one way and the other with your mind and should I do this, should I do that and all that kind of stuff. And then you find that as soon as you've done it, as soon as you, you whatever decision it is, because you've thought long and hard about it, it's actually going to be all right. And that was certainly what happened when I arrived uh, in the shanty town of Nueva Prosperina in Ecuador in 2004. I remember, I remember looking out on that first night. I was staying in Father Tom Oates' house for a couple of months at the start. Um, I remember looking out and all you could see for miles and miles was... Um, bamboo huts. You, you would, you, in Scottish term, you would call them a bamboo hut, uh, but these were people's houses for miles and miles and miles. A dirty street, a smelly street. There was no running water. There was no electricity. Uh, there was crime, uh, at times violent crime, etc. And but I remember looking out that first night and saying, "This is where I want to be." Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here. This is where I'm happy to be, and I think this is what God's calling me to. Uh, that was certainly the initial, uh, the initial, my initial thoughts as I got there. Uh, sorry, you asked about um, how was I welcomed. I think throughout my five years uh, on the missions, I was welcomed with open arms. Um, um, the Latins have are very demonstrative compared with. Uh, Northern Europeans, um, and they were just very, very welcoming and very enthusiastic for me being there. Um, so I think that was my first impressions of being welcomed. Mm -hmm. And in terms of you know standout memories and stories, I'm sure there was lots and lots. A, a few that you'd mentioned in the past was having a gun put to your head. Um, a parish church that was opened through through Scottish funds, um, a fellow called Alberto and a lady who was in hostel. So, expand on those for us. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, so, well, the the one that you mentioned, um, the gun against the head. Um, I, I in the initial stages, um, in the first two years, I was there for five years, and in, in the first two years, I wasn't allowed. Um, to have, I had a bank account, but I wasn't allowed to have a checkbook. Um, foreigners coming in, you know, they they wanted them to uh, be in the country for a certain a, a period of time. But in the even in the initial stages, certainly within within the first year, mm -hmm. uh, we'd started building with Scottish funds. We'd started building classrooms. Uh, the the school, uh, the Holy Family School, Sagrada Familia School in the shanty town, um, <clears throat> had nine um, wooden huts. So we started building with Scotch funds. Uh, we started building classrooms, uh, brick built classrooms. Sorry, um, and obviously that needed money. Um, and so instead of having a checkbook. I had to go and get the I had to go and get the cash every so often, mm -hmm. um, and from time to time I was coming out with five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand uh, dollars in 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 a wallet kind of thing, you know, uh, or in a folder, um, and it was one of those days that, um, as far as I, I remember, it was five thousand uh, dollars I had taken out that day to pay the workers, mm -hmm. and. I remember there's a big uh, Coca-Cola factory in the city of Guayaquil uh, on one of the main avenues, Juan Tanca Marengo uh, Avenue, and um, I was stopped at traffic lights, and in fact there was such a build-up of traffic that I had to, it took two changes of the traffic lights for me to get to the front of the queue, and it was while I was at the front of the queue that, um, th I mean, this attack it was all over within 10 seconds. Um, the door burst open and they'd obviously been following me. So they'd seen, um, obviously, you know, the, the drive on the other side of the road. So it, it came at me from my side, the gun against the head. And he says, give me the cash, give me the cash, dame la plata. And he stretched over to the passenger seat and got the got the uh, the folder 
um, with the money, and I'm not. I, I can never. Re I couldn't remember at the time, and I can't really remember now whether it was the same person or someone else came in and disabled the car, took out the keys, um, and uh, ran away or went away in their uh, speed speed off car. Um, so, um, and of course. The next thing was the traffic lights changed and everyone started tooting their horns at me and saying, hey, what are you doing? And all that kind of stuff. Um, and I said, I've been attacked, I've been attacked. Um, so we managed to, uh, the chewing gum sellers and the cigarette sellers managed to push my car over to the other side where there was a garage. And I managed to call various people. Um, amongst them uh, was the soldiers who came, or the policemen rather, who came uh, to report the crime and uh, to take details. And I remember asking the guy, because in general I'm a naive guy, I remember asking the guy, I said, so the, the policeman, I said, do you think um, do you think the, the bullets in the gun were real bullets or do you think they were plastic bullets? Do you think it was a kind of, I'm not saying a toy gun, but you know, do you think mm. they were kind of fake? And he just burst out laughing at me. And that was the answer. And in fact, the next day, I read in the report, uh, read in the papers, a report of a similar attack in the exact same location. And a 10-year-old boy uh, was a passenger in the seat and he was shot in the leg. So uh, it was actually real. So I, I, it was a, yes, it's a terrifying experience, but it wasn't the experience that, um, that uh, you know, you know, it put me off. Uh, in fact, anything, I remember driving back in, having been at the police station and reported and all that kind of stuff. I remember driving back in, into the shantytown. So the shantytown had, seven, or at least my area, had 70,000 uh, people in it. And I remember driving in off the, off the kind of bypass and a bizarre thought, driving in and think to myself, thank God I'm home. And almost instantly I thought, you know, anyone back home in Scotland, probably, there are many people, including my family, that would fear for me mm -hmm. in the shantytown. But here I was, I felt safest when I was in the shantytown. Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of, it helped me to to be able to side with people um, in the shantytown who were going through similar because if I was attacked once, then they were attacked hundreds of times and stolen from and everything, you know. And so we silver lining there as well. It didn't get all the money, was that right? No, absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't know why I did this. I really don't know why I did this. But uh, so it was. It, it, it let's, uh, as far as I remember, it was five five thousand. But half of the money I'd kept in the folder. And half of the money I'd put in the glove compartment, so they didn't actually get all the money. But there we are. That's. But they'd fought, It was a. It was a string of um, similar uh, robberies. They were called Saka Pintas. They. It, it's about the pinta, the 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 look of your face. So obviously, I definitely looked uh, European, <laughs> if not American. So he must. He must have cash. So we'll follow him. So they basically follow you from the back bank and then attack you. So that's yeah. that's how it was. How it was happening. I mean, the and, and talking, moving on, and to talk about the the parish church that was opened, mainly through the Scottish funds. That that must have been a source of great joy. Oh, it was. Um, I mean, I mean, as I say, w one of the things that happened during during my time in Ecuador was that um, the people were incredibly, the people back home were incredibly generous, mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt. That absolutely were incredibly generous. Uh, we were able to do so much for the school, build a whole school, build a parish church, build uh, community centres for seven of the p parts of the shanty town where I was. Um, we were also helped by the fact that um, you know the the currency in the in Ecuador is the American dollar, mm -hmm. so um, the exchange rate was incredible. Uh, during almost my whole time there, a pound, a UK pound, became two American dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
we were actually, you know, if if they were donating a hundred pounds, it was actually two hundred dollars. So mm-hmm. you could actually do twice, yeah. uh, twice, tw- twice, twice what you thought you might have been able to do in the initial stages. And which brings me to the parish church because um, when we sat down and planned a building of the parish church, um, it was on waste ground. It was on a very steep gradient. Um, and one of the architects came up with, a, or the architect who'd done a couple of the classrooms had come up with a a, a plan for a single story building. Uh, but the second architect, Pedro Mogrovejo, came up and said, no, I think we can build a parish church on top of a whole series of uh, meeting rooms mm-hmm. and a parish hall. Um and when we started building in 2005, uh, in the autumn of 2005, I think, um, um, we initially thought, um, well, I initially thought we'll, we'll only have money for for the first for the first floor. We'll do the we'll do the parish meeting rooms uh, and um, the kind of hall that we're going to build as part of the parish meeting rooms, that's where we can have mass. But money from Scotland just kept on coming. Uh, people were very, very generous. And it it became clear as we were halfway through the project that actually we could, you know, we still had the funds come in from Scotland to, to build the whole thing. So Scotland built the parish church of the precious blood of Christ parish Um you know, and it, as I say, it stands on a on a steep gradient. Um, it's withstood an earthquake of seven point two uh, while I was there. Um, you know, so it's going to stand for a long time, and it's a great testament to uh, the generosity of people back home, mainly in Scotland, but also uh, in other parts of the UK as well. Um, so, um, so it. it we started, I did say 2005, but we started building in 2006 uh, and it was completed within about uh, 15, 16 months. Um, and uh, Bishop Murray, um, who was bishop in uh, Guy on the Isles, he was former rector in the senior seminary, my former rector. Um, he came out to assist in the opening of the church along with uh, Father Donald Mackay, a good friend of mine from, uh, he was in Oban at the time. Um, they came out for the opening of the church in June uh, 2007. So it was a great, it was a great celebration. Uh, we managed to, um, as I say, we had eight chapels around the parish. We managed to get a celebration of all of the uh, communities uh, coming in to, to be part of the opening ceremony. And I'd never been involved in anything like that previously. I don't suppose uh, I'll be involved in the opening of many churches. Um, but it was a great celebration and it was a great testimony uh, to the liveliness of their faith and the generosity of the people back home. So it was a, it was a, it was a, definitely a key moment. So, I, mean, I mean, something like that is, is going to create, you know, a lifelong connection between Ecuador and Scotland, you know, countries that are thousands and thousands of miles away. Is that, is that how you felt at the time? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, one of the, one of the, yeah, of, of course, they're very demonstrative. Uh, Ecuadorians, Latins, are very demonstrative in their faith. So the opening mass wasn't, you know, um, wasn't a subdued affair. It was very lively, and I remember it as part of the offertory procession. Um, they carried in um, a sewn together flag. Uh, the top half was the Scottish flag, and the bottom half was the Ecuadorian flag, and it was a, it was a great symbol. So it, it, it for for many years uh, while I was there, it hung in the in the parish office. It was a great symbol of the um, the unity between the two countries, and I think the the banner was Ecuador y Escocia, amigos por siempre, Ecuador and Scotland, friends for life. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So. Um, and, and you and you mentioned um, a couple of people in particular, uh, a fellow called Alberto and, and a lady who was in hostel. Tell us a wee bit about them and why their stories stand out. Um, Alberto 
Uh, Alberto's uh, both both of them were lived very humbly and very simply. Um, um, Alberto lived a uh, hundred yards from uh, the school, the Sagrada Familia school. Um, he lived in very poor conditions. He was an old man, um, maybe in his seventies. Um, he had multiple health conditions, um, but I used to I used to laugh every Thursday night when we went down to that wee chapel for for mass, and you know because we were in a you know it was a kind of hut it was still at that stage we were celebrating mass in a hut, um, and um, at the off, at the bidding prayers I used to say if anyone has any prayers they want to pray for, you know, so people would shout out their intentions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Alberto, uh, he was a great friend, but Alberto, every week without fail, Alberto would pray in Spanish. He would pray, um, dear God, give Father Martin wisdom. And Lord hear us. And he did this every week. And eventually I said to him, I said, <laughs> Alberto, do you mean give Father Martin wisdom or do you mean give him more wisdom? You know, <laughs> and he he just kind of laughed. So I, I never actually got to the bottom of it, but he never stopped uh, praying for that I should get wisdom. I suppose I should pray that myself, you know, dear God, give me wisdom in honour of uh, Alberto. <laughs> no, um, no, he, he, he became ill uh, and passed away in very poor uh, and conditions, he he, uh, he died of a cancerous uh, disease, um, and I remember he, he had a big cancerous growth on his neck, um, which of course, if you can't afford to put food on your table, you're not going to be able to to afford the medical care that's needed uh, to cure you of your cancer mm -hmm. or to help you with your cancer. Um, the other lady. Uh, that you talked about, Lisbeth, uh, also lived, I used to visit her on a regular basis and um, she she lived in a in a poor uh, mud hut um, and the difference between her house and other houses was that she didn't have a floor. Uh, her floor was the ground mm -hmm. and the significance of that was that during the rainy season uh, each year, um, a stream would, you know, so th there's no, uh, it's difficult for us to imagine, you know, but before, before, you know, before they build houses in Kilmarnock, they'll, they'll irrigate the field and they'll put in drainage and they'll put in electricity. No, no. When you're in a shanty town, they just erect a house because we're poor and we haven't got anywhere to live. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that once you live there and there's no infrastructure, there was no drainage. And when it came to the rainy season, um, you know, the water just flowed through her house. Uh, and that's one of the astonishing things, or the things that astonished me, um, you know, when I used to go and visit her. Um, I mean, the, the, the room, her, her house had space for a bed. And, you know, it was probably three times the space of a bed was the house. So on the um as she during the rainy season as she lay in her poor bed, uh, I was on the other side of the stream flowing through her house. It was just a constant stream flowing through night and day. It was just it was an incredible image of out and out poverty. Um um sadly she also passed away and even her passing was was a traumatic experience for for her family and but even for me, um, they they phoned me up and said, uh, "Padre, um, her mum is about to die. Could you go out to the hospital where she is?" And you know, um, there was a hospital in Guayaquil, uh, Luis Vernasa. It was called the Hospital of the Poor, um, and on, you know, whenever I was called there, you were just struck by the poverty. There were no um, there were no beds. Mm -hmm. People were lying 
um, in the corridors, you know, with cancer and, you know, women giving birth. It was just, just it, with no beds, no mattresses, no nothing. Um, and I remember when I eventually, I had to wait for several hours, I think it was probably till 1 a.m. that Sunday morning, um, that I eventually got into Lisbeth House, uh, uh, Ward, sorry, and if you can imagine any the size of any ward um in cross house or any hospital in scotland um where you would normally get six beds um with plenty of space in between you know i would say in that room there was about 15 beds you know there was there was only space for me to get in between the beds by turning on my side, you know, there was no space for a chair. Mm -hmm. um, and up the central aisle, there was more beds. The most shocking thing was that, you know, apart from a bed sheet, everyone was naked. Um, there was no dignity, even in their dying days. Um, you know, there was no mattresses, there was no, you know, hospital pyjamas or anything. If they didn't have any pyjamas, they were just lying on with a great indignity on their bed. So, yeah, I think, I think Pedro in his dying and Lisbeth in her dying will be images that will stay with me that that kind of underline the great poverty and even as i'm speaking y you know uh, you know you kind of think well you know it's 15 16 17 years since those incidents have happened things must be better in the shanty town now the you know there's certain there's certain things that have changed uh, and I'll I'll see this when I go out in October. Mm. But there's other things which have not changed, and possibly because of COVID, have gone back. One of the images that that struck from the early days of COVID, when 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 we were all, all in lockdown, there was you were still in connection with the um, with the with the news bulletins from Ecuador in the shanty town area, where by by now in the whole shanty town, there's probably half a million people living there. Um, there was no, you know, because of COVID, n no one wanted to go in, no police, no doctors, no nurses. And up the central avenue of Nueva Prosperina, they were just piling up the dead bodies. So um, it was a disgraceful and shocking scene, um, but it's only from a couple of years ago. And so although people have improved in their poverty, I know for certain that uh, many people have gone backwards um, because they've got no jobs as well as have no no uh, health care and no education, you know. So it's um, those two people stand out. There's other people who stand out as being uh, kind of inspirational people, um, you know, uh, you know, families that... Um, you know, had great poverty uh, and in the midst of their poverty were dealing with a disability um, but managed to have dignity for their families or for their children, managed to, uh, you know, you know, get them, uh, scrape up enough money together to get them to school because they knew that probably the only way out of poverty was through education. Yeah. Uh, and... You know, I think in a shanty town, in in the shanty town, in my experience of the shanty town, there was probably although we were had a great, we were managed to get Sagrada Familia school up and running, and there's other schools, equivalent schools. Probably, there's still fifty percent um, of children can't afford schooling, although there are state schools, uh, they're jam packed and they can't take everyone and. The, the other schools that are not state schools, you've got to pay for them and can't afford them. So, whereas here we, it's something we don't understand in Scotland because education is universal, um, but in other parts of the world it's not universal. You know, so things that we take for granted in Scotland uh, are just, um, you know, real luxuries for yeah. many people in the world. And and you mentioned that you're going over in October. Have you been back quite a bit? 
over the years? I've probably gone back um, every second year, mm-hmm. um, sometimes with other people, sometimes with school groups from here, uh, from Scotland, but um, obviously I haven't been since uh, uh, 2018, so this is the first time in four years because of the pandemic, so um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to it and uh, anxious about it in equal measure. Mm-hmm. Um, because the the security uh, system is not great at the moment. It does seem to be centred around the Ecuadorian jails, but but <laughs> you still you still worry. But I I know they'll look after me. Um, the the people. It was only w- once you you come home and you realise. Wait a minute. Every time I walked through the the shanty town. There was always someone in front of me and someone behind me. I'm not saying they were bodyguards; they were just ordinary people. But there was always, I always seemed to be surrounded by people. So, <laughs> so I'm sure it'll be fine. And I'm staying. I'm staying. Uh, Padre Luis, the the present parish priest, has said that I'd be very welcome to stay in the chapel house, which Scotland built. Fantastic. So, as as somebody that's been a missionary, then you will have a fair handle on what are the most important qualities or characteristics that a missionary must possess. What do you think they are? I think I think the first thing is um you've got to be open to learn. Mm-hmm. Um you know naively uh, I and other missionaries have gone thinking you know I've got something to give. Um I've got something to I've got gifts and talents and resources to give. I, I'm the person who's giving here, but actually the best thing you can do is just receive and receive in abundance. Yeah, you know, th- th- that, th- you know, what we can, what we can give, you want to be open to people because if you're bringing them Christ as the main thing that you're bringing, then it's not Martin Chambers, it's not Colin McInnes or a- any other uh, missionary it's Christ, you know, and in fact, as much as you give, you'll receive, you know, in giving we receive, says the prayer. Um, so um, I think openness to learn, um, it's not just a thing that um, that I've learned on the missions. I'd, I was thinking about this earlier, I, th- I think I've been involved with HCPT, the charity that takes disabled children uh, to Lourdes Easter time um, and I think over the years one of the things I've learned is that you know as much as I give uh, during that week uh, I receive in abundance um, so I think I think to be open on the missions to be open to other people mm-hmm. um, and also to remember it's not my mission, but Christ's mission, is the is the is the thing. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned um, previously one of the hardest things when you were away uh, in in Spain was missing your family. So I'd imagine that that would be one of the negatives about being a missionary. But what would be some of the positives? Oh um, yes, I, I I yeah I I just underline that the the one of the negatives being away from my family when I was in the missions mm-hmm. was. Um, because of their honesty and sincerity and, <laughs> you know, stark messages, as your brothers and sister uh, will always tell you. Um, but some great, great advantages. Um, I've got some tremendous lifelong friends. I don't even have to, um, you know, we, I know that, um, y- you know, friends that have, all of those friends that lived in, great and abject poverty um, who who have just taught me so many lessons in life um, so I don't even need to I know that as soon as I turn up at the airport uh, there'll be a hug and uh, you know just a warmth um, I think also w- one of the things that, that being on the missions taught me uh, and I wasn't. I wasn't exactly aware of it when I immediately came back. But you know, 
after several years had passed of being back in Scotland and being in Kilmarnock and looking back, I realised, I think it's probably given me a better perspective in life. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, not to get too anxious about things. You know, uh, um, you know, because there, there's some, there's many, many people have to put up with the anxieties of life and live in abject poverty. If the statistics are correct, the majority of people in the world are living in poverty. Then, you know, you know, we have got... I, I don't just mean... And I'm, obviously, we run food banks in in Kilmarnock and in many of the parishes. There are mm. people who are desperately poor. But we have a government system that puts, you know, uh, an education system in place, that puts a health system in place, that puts a police system in place, you know, that puts, um, you know, sewerage in place, you know, to help the building of safe and secure houses, you know. So I think probably to, to put a bit of perspective into into living. I think also one of the lessons um, that I learned was how to be a priest. Um, you know, the, just serving, um, not looking for, um, I'm not sure that I did this anyway, but, uh, you know, but not looking for honour and, you know, just being with people was was mission enough. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there might be a, a parish programme to undertake or a sacramental programme or a mission to, uh, to, to the people in secondary school or visits to the second housebound. There might be sacramental things to do, but actually being with people is what Jesus did and what we can do, you know. So I think I think it gave me a lesson for life, but also a lesson on how to be how to be a priest, you know. So would that be what the term mission means to you? Would it be being with people or do you have a, a different kind of definition of what you think it would be? Well I, I think I think the mission as 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 I think I said, I think the mission is the mission of Christ. Um and yes, it's the mission of the church. Um, so it's it's taking the mass to people, it's taking the sacraments to people, it's taking to it's taking Catholic education to people, but actually, it's you know, God's first and foremost, it's God's plan for the world, mm -hmm. um, and whether you're a godly person or not a godly person, and this means as much in Kilmarnock or any part of Scotland as it does in Ecuador, mm -hmm. um, you know, to people of faith and no faith, y you can still experience love and hope and justice and dignity in life. You know, we call those gifts, we as Christians call those gifts, Christian gifts and gospel gifts. But it, the mission of the church is to is not just to its own people. It's not just within the mission or the walls of the church. It's out with the church. Pope Francis is always saying this is out with uh, the church where we have to have the smell of the sheep. Uh, go out to the peripheries and find people who are on the margins of society and help them find those original gifts before they were formed in the womb of uh, joy and peace and hope and dignity and self-respect and love. So that's the mission. It's the mission of God to the whole world. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, lay people, um, what's the best way they can live out their mission and be missionaries? Well, you know, to, you know, as I say, it's it, it, it certainly a lesson that I learned in life enhanced by my experience of working on the missions. But, Everyone can experience um, being part of the mission by sharing in, you know, those gifts, um, 
helping people to come to those gifts of love and peace and honesty and dignity, um, self-respect, you know, and you can do it in Scotland by reaching out to people in any kind of need, by, you know, going out yourself to the peripheries. And the peripheries might, might mean um, working with uh, young people in schools. It might mean helping families who are coming along to the food banks. It might mean helping in healthcare, or it might be, you know, you know, help, helping people establish themselves in society. But everyone can be part of that reaching out mission uh, of taking Christ's gospel and the values of Christ's gospel uh, to uh, to people in their daily lives, and it brings it brings it back to you know the spirituality of Saint Ignatius. It, it's helping people to find God in their daily lives, mm-hmm. um, not just in churchiness. Just uh, in terms of you, you know, you've experienced the church in Ecuador and the church here. What do you think? What do you think the differences are? Um, I think um, I think there's a, a real depth to our spirituality here. Um, you know, there's been a real willingness um, since the Second Vatican Council uh, of communities in Scotland to embrace the idea that God is calling us into a community of faith. It's you know, so there's a, a real depth to that. Um, you know, and I think that's experienced um, in the church in Ecuador. But I, I would say rather than a, a difference in um, the way the church is experienced between Scotland and Ecuador, I think it's probably just the difference in um, the way that people are. Uh, I remember when I went to Cochabamba it, it, as part of the enculturation course before I arrived in the missions, mm-hmm. one of the courses I took was just in the difference between cultures of the world, you know, and and th- th- it was a very rudimentary map, but it, the the lecturer basically divided the map into uh, three, uh, rather than areas of the world, three mindsets of the world. So there was the Northern European, American, Australian model of the world, and then there was the Hispanic, Latin model uh, model of the world and then there was the kind of Asian model of the world He's uh, we, di- we didn't go into great depth about the Asian model because the, the, the was in the course there wasn't um, uh, you know there wasn't a- anyone from that part of the world taking part in the course yeah. but he basically said that um, they they tend that in that part of the world they tend to live in the future um you know whereas in you know in northern european it's it's about uh, looking to the past and building on the past whereas in the latin church it's living in the present okay. you know and you know there's not it's not that one's right or wrong mm-hmm. you know it's just the way that, it's the way they are. Latins are always living in the in the uh, in the in the present moment, and whereas in sorry, I did say the Asians. The, the model said the Asians lived in uh, the future, but actually it was it was the Europeans that are always living in the future, always living, planning ahead, planning for the future, and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, building on things, you know. And it it was one of the um, you know one of the my mistakes uh, uh, on living in the in the missions was wanting to get them to plan for the future. Well, you know, you you can't. They, their their mindset is living in the present. Let's celebrate the present. They were always saying, "Let's," you know, and you know that's that's why, for instance, a wedding that was planned at seven o'clock on a Friday night could be cancelled till ten o'clock. Because the auntie so and so had come down from the capital city, and we hadn't seen her for years, so we had to before we were even getting ready for the wedding, we had to go and have a meal with with her. And you can just say, but the wedding was it, you know, the wedding yeah. was something, you know. So, so I think in terms of the church, if we are all always planning for the future, um, from a European, Northern European mindset, 
then you know in in Latin in Latin America they're they're constantly living in the present you know so mm-hmm. so I think that's the and did you find that refreshing? I found it refreshing. I found it challenging because <laughs> because I was frustrated on many occasions. But no, um, you know, just being open and and that's that's why, for instance, um, it, one of the things I hadn't mentioned was it, one of the beautiful experiences. We had two of them actually. Um, the my last two years uh, in in Ecuador. By that stage, the parish church was up and up and built. Um, we had um, two Easter vigils, mm-hmm. all night Easter vigils, from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And it was just the most lively, faith-filled experience. All parts of the parish came together. Uh, we had the big bonfire outside for the service of light, which in in our liturgy is over in a matter of minutes. Uh, whereas in, in the Latin American experience, because we were all throwing things onto the fire that we want, you know, our past sins, uh, we wanted, you know, and then the celebration of Christ being the light, it was a big dance affair and all that stuff. Then there was a couple of hours of readings from the scriptures, uh, then there was the Eucharist and uh, the sending out and the baptismal liturgies as well. It was They were great, um, lively, lively uh, liturgies of just celebrating the the present love that was in the community. So, if we talk about, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned some of the support you've got from from Scotland in the past, and obviously you were uh, the diocesan director for for Missio Scotland, um, so you know a bit about the support that uh, Missio Scotland provides. What, why do you think it's important for people to support the work of Missio Scotland and its partners in the the Pontifical Mission Societies? Because, um, because. You know, there are people in need. There are people in need. The majority of the world's population lives in abject poverty. And that is not part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, God's plan is that everyone should have dignity. Everyone should have love. Everyone should have equal opportunities to the the resources. It's it's part of God's plan that, you know, uh, the abundance of the world's resources should be shared. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we have an abundance, then, you know, we should reach out to them, not just because they're in need. That would be an important thing. Uh, not just because today I've not got food on my table. Um, it would be important to reach out for that reason. But also because before I formed you in the womb, I knew you through and through. God had a plan of love before we were even born. Mm-hmm. We'll finish up on a, a really light-hearted note and just tell people something about yourself that they might not know. Oh, um, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, that um, what might they not know? I don't know. Um, I go and um, I enjoy going to the football. Uh, I enjoy uh, playing the guitar. Um, I was uh, um, just remembering I've got a whole catalogue of songs that I learned from uh, from way back mm-hmm. um, um, that uh, that I often sing to the to the school kids um, um, do you want me to sing a song? go for it <laughs> um, hold on he takes a drink. It's just a very short. It's a very short um, song that possibly uh, when you were in the uh, Jared, when you were in the primary school at St John's and Stevenson, it certainly learnt it there because the teacher, the primary one teacher at the time, was a teacher who's now retired called Celia Deering. I remember. It became yeah. the she became the head teacher at St John's, but she taught me a song, and it goes like this: It's about God's love, and. and Unfortunately, it's got actions to it, uh, <laughs> which you can't see. But uh, you can imagine drawing a circle. Um, so it's called God's love is like a circle. God's love is like a circle, a circle big and round. And when you see a circle, no ending can be found. And so the love of Jesus goes on eternally. 
forever and forever. I know that God loves me. And I thank Celia Deering for teaching me that in primary one when I was ordained uh, 33 years ago. It's a song that I'll probably take for the rest of my priesthood, uh, both in uh, primary schools and in the parishes. And I don't think there's a better way to end than a wee song. So thanks a lot, Father, for taking the time out to speak to us. And all the best. Thank you very much, Gerrit. Missio Scotland is the Scottish branch of the Pontifical Mission Societies, the Pope's official charity for overseas mission. To learn more about the work of Missio Scotland, you can visit our website www.missioscotland.com. You can like us on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash Missio Scotland. You can also follow us on Twitter, Missio underscore Scotland, and on Instagram, Missio Scotland. If you would like to donate to Missio Scotland, visit www.missioscotland.com slash donate. You can also call us on 01236 449 774 or send donations to Missio Scotland, 4 Laird Street, Coatbridge, ML5 3LJ. Please keep us in your prayers. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>